This is a recording for the Club Hat Project. My name is Matthew O'Brien. Today is the Matthew 19th. Australia, Michael. That's right. <laughs> Today is the nineteenth of July, twenty twenty-three, uh, and I have here with me Jeremy Hill. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, can you uh, confirm for the recorder that you're happy to take part in this project? Yes, yeah, sure, I am. Fantastic. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, could you just spell your name for the for the recorder? J E R E M Y H I W L. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, so we might just start with something broad um, and, and delve into your kind of early life. Um, so could you tell me a bit about your early life, maybe where you were born, where did you grow up, um, and maybe some of your early memories? Well, I was born born in Dublin, 1943. Um, my father was in the Irish Army uh, at the time. Uh, so my first two years as a, as a child were in a barracks in Kerr and then down in Foynes uh, and uh, shortly after the war ended my father bought uh, a house in Waterford. He was a doctor so he was in the medical um, corps in, in the army so uh, he bought a house in Waterford to set up a medical practice there. So uh, that was about 1946 I think they bought it. So. Uh, and we lived there um, until I was, and then I went to school at Newton, Newtown School in Waterford in the in very early days, uh, or primary school. And then at the age of nine, I was sent off to boarding school to um, up in County Meath, Headford School in Kells in County Meath. Uh, that was when I was nine. Uh, then when I was 13, 14, I went over to school in England for four years. So that was the sort of early days. But um, I don't remember much about the very early days. I remember little or nothing. I'd have loved to have remembered about being in Foynes because the flying boats were there and I eventually became a pilot in Aer Lingus. But I don't remember a thing about the flying boats. So uh, uh, so that's nothing. Nor anything about the army. I mean, I was a two there. But then, I, But I kind of remember being in the garden in early days in Catherine Street in Waterford um, and then I remember going to going to school uh, up to primary school in Newtown which is about probably about three quarters of a mile walk uh, and you were just sort of packed out the door and walk off to school as a five or six year old or something mm. that sort of thing that wouldn't be happening now um, and school school days were terrific but then, and, and oh, yeah, look, we just had a lovely time. And Waterford was such a great situation, close to the sea, Dunmore, East Tremor, all those sorts of places. Uh, it was a small little town. Uh, as a child, uh, you could wander, wander wherever you want. But my parents, they liked the outdoor life. The father used to hunt, or used to shoot and fish. My mother was into horses, so she used to go hunting. So a lot of the life was. Uh, going off and fishing in the local streams and rivers, going down to Dunmore East or Tremor, swimming. Sunshine always, sun always shone when you were a child, never rained. And uh, yeah, we just led a, a very sort of country rural life, quiet life. Um, uh, it was thoroughly pleasant. Uh, and school was a sort of a paradise too, because the Hedford School was out. In the, in the Hedford Estate, just outside Kells, uh, a small little school. There were fifty-two people there boarding when I started at the age of nine. There were seventy odd when I left, so it was tiny, tiny little school. But this brilliant house, I mean, an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary house, uh, owned by Lord and Lady Hedford, who were still alive at the time, and they were trying to find something to do with the house because their son, there, I think they only had one son. Uh, so they, had, they were rattling around in this huge place. So I set up a school. Uh, and I remember them as very kindly, benevolent sort of people. And uh, 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 and then the, all the staff were wonderful. Uh, but a nine-year-old off to boarding school, uh, you know, people nowadays sort of think, oh, there was cruelty to children. But for me, and I think all the other guys that were there, and there was only boys, uh, Look, that was just what what life was. You just you went to school. You so you went to school, and if you went to boarding school, you went to boarding school. So there wasn't a choice. You couldn't protest, and you didn't. But everybody else did that we knew. 
Um, but there were wonderful times. It was absolutely wonderful. And it was, um, and it was the same, uh, same over uh, in when I went over to England. A similarly wonderful place. Um, but part of the problem was that you spent, uh, I don't know how many months of the year it was, but you're away at boarding school. Then you come back to where you live in Waterford and you find you don't actually know very many of the people in the town. Uh, but I didn't notice that. Uh, I didn't notice that at the time because you're, you know, you're young. You're not sure how the whole world works anyway. So when you look, when you know how the world works now at this stage of my life, uh, you can see that uh, yeah, it was probably it was difficult. So I, I didn't know many people around Waterford, uh, but I knew it existed and how it worked and all that sort of thing. But I have great affection for Waterford. But but apart from that, I didn't know the people until you know, uh, 10 or 20 years after I'd left school and I was going down to see the parents, you'd go out to the pub for a drink with somebody, you'd be meeting people and you'd have heard of them. And yeah, yeah. so you, I got to know Waterford people that way. But but the other the other thing that happened to me was that when the school holidays came along, uh, uh, my par parents were so busy hunting, shooting, fishing, swimming, tennis, doing all this sort of thing, that they had no time for the boys when, when you, the little boy who came back from school so we were sent up to our grandparents' place up here at Monk's Grange, where my mother was uh, reared. So my mother was from here, um, and we came up. We'd come up here for a, for a week or ten days or more of the of the four week school holidays. So again, you're sort of separated away from Waterford. Um, but that whole experience of coming up here with my grandparents, uh, which I wouldn't have been aware of at the time, was that um, that was a time that was pre television. There was radio. Uh, uh, electricity was scarce up here. They had a homemade system, so there was conversation. That's all there was here: conversation. So this, to a young boy, a nine, ten, or eleven-year-old, to be sitting down with grandparents who did nothing but talk all day, was hard going, and they were never conversations about the weather or. Who died, or what funeral are you going to? It was all, uh, you know, molecular genetics and that sort of thing, and uh, science and uh, history and politics, and there were it was adult conversation, and we were supposed to be engaged with this. It was difficult, but I, it didn't matter because we were allowed out, and you could run around the garden here, you could run up the fields, and and uh, you could go down to the kitchen and I'd laugh at the maze, but you weren't supposed to go down to the basement because that's where work happened. You know, no, you know, these sort of places, work didn't actually happen. People lived here. Laborers did the job out in the fields, but they were hidden by the trees. So you didn't watch work, you didn't see work. All the farm buildings are at the back of the house here. So you don't see farm buildings. So you just get the impression as you arrive up, this is where people, all they do is live here. Uh, and I can see that now, but we, we were able to, we were able, as kids, we were able to escape it because uh, the local guys who were working here, I mean, and a lot of their descendant families are still here now uh, around the place. I mean, they were all great crack in a bit. So that, that was a relief. There were different conversations there, although we weren't, we were playing with them, yeah. as I say. So that, that was a, a very nice memory of, of, of the childhood. Well, I have very nice memories of being in Catherine Street, but I realise now that. Uh, my parents would be up for for child abuse, you know, because they, they didn't love us enough to keep us at home in the school holidays for the time. Uh, but that was the way it was. And other than the differences you've just kind of pointed out, were there any other differences between Waterford and here in you know, the sits I come out? Like anything strike you when you were when you were young, or even as you kind of got a little bit older? Um. Uh, no, um, I mean the physical, the phys physicality of the place was a great freedom. As I was speaking in town, I mean, where you knew you couldn't, you know, they didn't want you falling in the river, you know, that kind of thing, and they didn't want you to get lost, and they, you weren't going to go out at night. Um, not that it was particularly dangerous then compared to what it is these days, but it was a, uh, it was a more confining space, and, and that wasn't to water was detriment, or my opinion of water was detriment. But the, but the life was entirely different. The life was different uh, between living in a, I suppose, a, a, as a father, you'd consider, say, he was in the professional class. Uh, and so he's working that. Um, and uh, then you come up here and, um, yeah, it, it, it was different. There were two different places. And school. So there were three different places, really. 
uh, in, in my young life. There was school, there was Waterford, and there was here. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't there at those time. I wasn't there to sort of interpret all this or to make sense of it all. It's just the way it was. But when I look at it now, it was a, uh, it was absolutely brilliant for me. It was brilliant, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and what what was your grandparents' connection then to this area and to this estate? Um, well, my grandfather, uh, my grandfather was a um, a descendant of the original. Um, um, creator of the place. Uh, my grandmother uh, was from London. Her family were, were, um, uh, were from London. Uh, uh, and the, the marriage really arose. My grandfather went to Cambridge uh, and uh, uh, the grandmother came up to some event in Cambridge and they met there. That was in 1906. They didn't get married until 1914. Uh, but, uh, so she got, she came out of, out of, out of Putney and uh, sort of um, a, a, um, a well-off sort of merchant class family in London into the depths of the countryside. Uh, whereas he, he, was, uh, he was born in London as well because his parents uh, went over to London for 20 years from 1880 to 1900. And they grew up, they, they lived in a place called uh, Bedford Park in Chiswick, which was a sort of aesthetic, um, aesthetic movement, sort of cooperative place to live. The Yeats's were, were family, were neighbours and family friends for, for life afterwards, and all sorts of intellectuals. It was a very, it was a bizarre little enclave of, of intellectuals and aesthetes. Uh, uh, so they, so the, that was that was my grandfather's background. But then you go back. I mean, go, then you go back to the start of this place. It was 1769. The house was completed by a fellow called Goddard Richards, uh, and so the house was at Richards uh, until. There was only a daughter left, and she married an orphan, got out orphan in 1880, uh, and uh, so then it became the orphans were the names of the family, and then my uncle, um, he died without children in 1984, and uh, so we inherited then, uh, so it became Hill. So, but we're, we're, we're blood descendants of the original, uh, Goddard Richards, who was a descendant of a fellow called. Solomon Richards, Colonel Solomon Richards, who came over with Cromwell, uh, became governor of Wexford post Cromwell, uh, and um, was given a grant of lands uh, by Cromwell. That's how soldiers were paid, uh, and that grant of lands was confirmed by Charles II on the Restoration in a in a charter of uh, dated 1679 which we actually managed to purchase the original document about four or five years ago. So that started the Richards family in Wexford. These grants of lands, these 3,000 acres were down in the South County Wexford. And uh, they sold bits and pieces of the land to pay off the mortgages because as a soldier you had to borrow, keep yourself going, you didn't get paid wages. Uh, and then they, they, they speculated that was the way, of, the way the nature of the thing till eventually about two, three generations, two generations after the original Solomon, uh, you end up with a with uh, John Richards, who had uh, about uh, well, I, it, it sounds like around ten thousand acres, up in uh, uh, between around here and in northwest of uh, Enniscorthy. So they had a substantial bit of property, but he died in Tested in seventeen forty nine, and he had uh, four sons and a daughter, and the four sons and the daughter. Um, uh, agreed among themselves a settlement. Daughter got nothing. Women didn't get anything. They didn't matter. They could marry money. Uh, the the uh, the eldest son Solomon, uh, another Solomon Richards, got the uh, the land northwest of Enniscorthy. It was the best land. He got the prime land. The other uh, brothers uh, got pieces up here, but decided they didn't particularly like it, so gave it to their brother, Goddard. So mm -hmm. Goddard Richards started up around here. Was something like three thousand acres. It was pretty rough land at the time. They're up on the side of the mountain. There's still the remains of the great forest, the, 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 the great forest of uh, Colocrum, and uh, the white white mountain there was covered in forestry. Uh, so you had to clear land uh, in order to build a house and to try and make a farm that was was going to sustain a house. So uh, uh, that's that, that that's. This, that's how we arrived, the family arrived here 
and we're all descendants then of that. Uh, and were there any? I'm just curious. Were there any kind of stories or kind of folk tales about those landscape areas that have to be, you know, cleared? Um, uh, um, nothing about the clearance. We have a document, uh, 1757 survey, uh, uh, of the land. There's 122 cleared acres, and there are field names. There are 10, 12 field names uh, um, defined on the survey. Five or six of those are still the names of the fields now. So you have a continuity of field names that comes down through. That's that's not ab- abnormal, but uh, but it's interesting to have it actually documented uh, in a, in, a docu- in a in one of the early documents. And it's got the site of a house, but it's not the site as it was here. So in 1757, they were still deciding where to go, where to actually build the house. Um, and I know that, and there's a, there's a snippet of a paragraph, and I don't know what the source is, but it says that Goddard Richard's main source of income was an annual auction of horses that were running wild on the mountain, and uh, he didn't own the mountain up there. That was Commons land up there, so it was Crown land. That would have been Crown land at the time, uh, and the horses horses just wild, but somehow he managed to organize this auction where you bid for 10 horses so you paid your 100 quid or your one quid whatever it was for 10 horses and then you had to go up the mountain and uh, round them up and take them off home with you so it was a brilliant scam i mean he was selling uh, selling goods that he never produced or owned <laughs> but he got people to pay for them <laughs> so that's a that's a sort of nonsense story at the same time he's building a building a reasonably substantial house and, and the estate itself, um, other than kind of farming, did it play on any other kind of significant role in the broader community? Uh, yeah, well, that's, uh, we could be here for a week. Um, uh, look, it depends, it depends on how this perspective and all that. Yes, it did. It did, because uh, as soon as you've got a place this big and you've got a farm, you need labour. So you, you're, you're providing work. Uh, not that that was the motivation, but it's a fact of the matter. So there, there. Are, what else would you do up here unless you were a timber merchant or you're working, or you're felling, felling the timber? Uh, uh, so a, a community. Uh, well, this would have been the centre of the community. Castle Boro, uh, the Lord Carew's place was was about five miles further south, but they had proper they had proper land, so to speak, whereas this is mountainy land. Um, uh, and they were, um, I mean, they were, um, their, their nobility, whereas their, their gentlemen here, there was no, there were none of Richards and Co. weren't titled. <clears throat> so they're not aristocrats, they're not, um, they're not nobility. Uh, so it was a, played a slightly different role. Well, not, no, it's not a different role, but the, or, the, the sort of role was slightly different. But yeah, the job opportunity was beginning to happen. And that job opportunity then, uh, continued on for 200, 250 years. Okay. Um, and I guess, because, yeah, bringing it into kind of more present present day, what's, how has that maybe the role of this property and this estate changed in, in that time? Um, well, I don't think they. I don't think any of them ever sat down and defined a role. They they lived their lives and the type of life that they lived, and what they choose to do with their life, uh, created. Um, created the function of the house and and uh, what its relationship therefore was going to be, um, uh, with 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 the locals. Uh, and I'm not. I'm not. That's not a disparaging word at all. It's, it's just. Uh, uh, and, and look, from my point of view, you know, I grew up, as I said, I tell, telling you about going down below stairs to the kitchen and the maids down there were probably four or five years older than I was. They grew up and they, they you know, they worked for my grandmother and a lot of them, five, quite a lot, five or six of them working in the household. So we got to know them and we still know them and we know their descendants and everything. So we're, we're very bound in a community now to that. So the, the wall around the house, around the, uh, there isn't a, a continuous wall around the state. There's a front wall at the entrance gate. So we're not a walled off um, uh, estate. There's a boundary and there are, the boundary trees are Scots pines, which are no, well known as sort of gentlemen's trees because they 
they boundaries of gentlemen's rights. So there was a defined territory, uh, uh, but it wasn't the intimidating barrier that Nulo Freyron used to say would give her a shiver every time she passed the the, 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 the gates of a, a big house. That never that brought that never happened here. There wasn't that sort of atmosphere here. And then I mean, when seventeen ninety eight came along. Uh, my ancestor uh, at the time was a curate in, in Killan Church. Uh, and on the vestry of Killan Church, the Protestant Church, was John Kelly, Kelly the boy from Killan. That wasn't uncommon to have a Catholic on the vestry of the Protestant Church because it was easier to send a Catholic out to collect the tithes than it was to send the Protestant. But Kelly was, Kelly was, um, Kelly was quite friendly with the family here. First of all, then you knew them uh, through the, uh, being on the vestry committee. And then they also had, a, I think they had a friendship relationship and a historical novel was written by my great grandmother about the time then and, you, and he is, he's described as coming to the door and coming in and sitting down and eating and dining with them. So, uh, so the, the religious barrier is, is, is linked or crossed immediately back in 1798. So when the rebellion broke out and Father Murphy is... Um, you know, he, he wins wins the Battle of Owlet and then he continues around Gore and comes back down towards in Uh John Kelly raises uh, an army of Bantrymen. This is the Barony of Bantry. Uh, and uh, things were getting hot uh, and the local Protestants here were getting worried that they were going to, going to suffer. And uh, they all assembled here in the yard because they came to the you know the the big house so to speak for, for, for leadership or whatever uh he's also the clergyman so uh you know he has that sort of thing so there was so they're assembled here kelly raises probably four or five hundred men and uh he marches them through here and up onto Sleebourne, which is the hill just behind us here in front of blackstairs mountain and uh this is a group of rebels led by Kelly, the rebels want to um, sack the place here. Kelly says, no, he said, we don't want to do that. Kelly has his, uh, his relationship with them here. And it, look, it's very hard, very hard to define. There are three or four stories in written accounts um, within a generation or so of the thing. So they're reasonably accurate sort of accounts, but there are two or three of them. So the, 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 the best we can assume happened is that Kelly negotiated with his own men. He said, look, let those, there's a whole lot of them gathered up in the yard. Let them go. He said, we've got to get into Enniscorthy. He said, the major battle in there, don't mind this lot. Uh, so and the messenger was sent down to say, you've got two hours to get out of here. So they did, they fled. Uh, and um, uh, the, the uh, Kelly and his Benjamin then marched uh, into Enniscorthy. So the house wasn't uh, sacked or burned or killed and there was nobody killed, no, there wasn't an action here. So the, the, um, the 20 or so families that assembled here went to New Ross, along with my forebears here. Uh, and uh, my forebears then went on to Waterford, got the boat over to England and went into exile in England for 20 years. So the place is empty. There were a couple of agents that were put in here to try and get a bit of rent from the land. Uh, but uh, look, I, I, you know, one or two, they might have occupied the house and they weren't looking after it and maybe they, they could have sold timbers or something. It wasn't ruined inside, but it wasn't in good condition when they came back. But the point of the exercise, the point of what I've just said is to refer to, this, uh, to the uh, connectedness, even in 1798, between the religions and the classes uh, that really saved the place. Um, and that was the start of, of that sort of uh, a, a relationship. You know, when it came to the land wars later on, there were nearly 150 tenants in here, and we have the ledgers, the tenants' ledgers. Uh, and there's, you know, even in even in the famine times, uh, there's nobody nobody in arrears. Uh, there's only one recane. By the time you get to the 1870s and so in the 1880s, there's one agitator, the land war agitator, but the rest are not. They're, they're quiet. Uh, uh, because they've had a hundred years of relationship with the place. But this, this one guy was a, look, it, it, perfectly understandable. You've you got one man who says, I'm not having them. Uh, 
but nothing. But again, uh, nothing happened in the land wars. When we get to uh, the War of Independence, on into the Civil War, um, the same thing as the Kelly thing repeated itself. A man called Miley Fenlon worked for my grandfather here uh, as a carpenter. Uh, he, uh, uh, but he was a member of the local IRA. Uh, and they were burning the houses around here. So in February uh, 2022, um, what's 22, 23, God, I can't remember. Anyway, Castle Bora is burned, Wilt, uh, that's five miles away, Wilton is burned, six miles away, and um, Coolbourne is burned, four miles away. This place is here, and it's still standing. Um, Miley Fenland comes to the grandfather one morning, Monday morning, and he says the house is to be burned but if you get out of here by Wednesday or Thursday I'll go back to my boss and I'll tell them that I ran you out of the country and I'll try and keep the house on the bottom of the list in other words we'll go we'll burn another house tonight not one kind uh, so they left my grandparents my grandfather my grandparents left with the two children three children and they were over in England on the Thursday leaving behind uh, his parents. So that's God out open and his wife Adela. So they're just in their 60s. Uh, so the house, first of all, the irregulars come up here and they come looking for blankets and guns and anything that they can get to keep themselves warm out when they're out, you know, on the run of, uh, you know, out, out in the mountain. Uh, and there are very good uh, first-hand accounts from, from people of those raids, that raid. And then, um, then the the free staters come, and they do the same thing. They want blankets and feed and everything. So you've got two sides of the civil war, each having a cause to burn this place. The free staters were to burn it because it was because the irregulars used it. The irregulars were, could have burned it because the free staters used it. Yet the place survived. Uh, and then, <clears throat> 1927, Miley Fenlon rings up England and says, "You can come back now." And he came back in 1927. Fenland gets his job back again, and they all live happily ever after. So, so you get, again, you have this um, a relationship between. I mean, this is the Fenland, Miley Fenland uh, um, relationship is that here you've got you've got a Catholic, you've got a labourer, you've got a, he's a tenant, and he's dealing with his landlord. He's dealing with the, with the, with the gentry class. Uh, uh, yet each is dependent on the other for their future. So if he burns the house, his job is gone and his life is gone. So he's probably going to go to England next. So he's he's got a reason for saving the place. The grandfather's got a reason for doing a deal because if the deal comes off, then the place is saved. And you have these people from the from the from from totally different poles, totally different politics, totally different religions, social strata, everything. Yet they save one another and therefore save the place again. So the place is saved twice by knowing the right people in the right place at the right time. 1798 and 1923. That's so that, but that relationship um, goes on and on up to, up to today, and we've just uh, we've just discovered over the, in, the la in the last year the meaning of uh, a whole lot of paperwork that we've just discovered, and it's about the revitalisation of rural Ireland uh, and how you um, at a time you know they've been through the 1930s, the economic war. And that you know the agriculture is beggared, so you know you're not employing a labour because there's nothing to make a profit on to pay the labour. So these guys are impoverished. They're going overseas. They're going to England. Uh, rural Ireland is being depopulated. Uh, so what do you do in a village to keep people in the village? And these people sitting up here, my grandfather and the uncle, uh, 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 devise. Uh, they do a, socio a sociological study, socio-economical study, really, of the region. Uh, 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 and then they do a town planning uh, uh, thing on Rathnure uh, to establish a village that will entice people to stay. Uh, and we've got the documents. We're only just looking at the this thing. It's a this is a, this is a really extraordinary story. It 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 would have to be for a professional historian to interpret it. I can't do it, but I can I can I can I can put the proposal and I can write that out. Uh, and I, I have had a couple of historians who've had a quick look and said, uh, you know, here we go. It's a PhD topic. It's a PhD study, without question. But it's a fascinating one. Uh, and 
Well, look, I'll just, just to end that story, uh, about three or four weeks ago, somebody rang me up from a region here and I said, look, I, we've got a community um, development um, project running here and I'm on it from Rathnewer and the county council of, of, uh, are on it. So it's a county council community um, organisation coming together to say, how can they re revitalise Rathnewer? And I said, geez, I said, this is good timing. Uh, I said, uh, and I showed them the, doc doc the document. Uh, it's a drawing of Rathnewer as it, they wanted to turn it into here to make it a, a vital village. And they looked at it and they said, what the date of this document? I said, it's 1946. He said, this, this is what we've got. We've just started drawing this up and this is what we got. And you've done it 80 years beforehand here. And I said, well, these bloody people here who were living here, well, they thought they, they were, they were intellectuals. This was their bent. My grandfather who'd been run out of the country came back here and he decided he had a choice. Uh, do I accept the new free state? Or do I stick with unionism and I go over to England and give up here? He said, no, he said, we'll, we, will, we will work with the state. So he worked, he did work with the state. He got involved in, in the formation of Fine Gael. He was a very early member. Uh, um, uh, he was one of the three founder members. Uh, and he, he advised um, James Dillon. He became friendly with James Dillon and uh, spent 20 years advising on the, uh, in the economics of, and the, ref, of the reform and whatever of, of, of agriculture uh, in Ireland. So, so this, again, uh, it's the, the relationship and the community that they're working for the community and they're working for the community in 1946 to redevelop the village to entice people to stay rather than to go to England. So that's, that's, the, that's the type of relationship that, that, that went on, that started off all those years ago. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a sociological study that really, it's going to, it'll happen. As I say, there's another, P, we have about 10 PhDs here uh, that we could do, we could start them tomorrow. And, and they'll happen. Um, uh, you know, Terry Dooley and his centre with the study of Irish houses and estates is up there, mm -hmm. is right up his alley. Uh, except that he hadn't thought of the economic stuff, and I'm feeding that into them there now. Uh, it was a brilliant study. Uh, um, uh, you see, one of the peculiarities with, with Terry, Terry Dooley wrote that book about burning the country houses, published I don't know, two or three years ago. I said to him, look, it's all very well, Terry, but you, uh, you know, why was Monk's Grange not burned? And why don't you look at the study? And he said, never thought of it right. <laughs> that's what, so that, that's a major study for, for a fellow at his level. I mean, he said it out of history there now. So he said, it is, you know, it's a, this is the kind of thing that he gets stuck into, it, which is really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the past, they did their work here quietly, unobtrusively, they got recognition, but no, no public recognition for it. But what they were doing was recognised as, as, as value. I mean, Goddard Open uh, was a historian who wrote the four volume History of Ireland under the Normans still. And he, that was published 1910 and 1919. Uh, and uh, those four volumes are still um, uh, still taught uh, in, in, in medieval history in, in Trinity and in UCD. Got in a little bit of trouble with O'Neill who uh, uh, in UCD, who said, how could, a, how could a Protestant living on a landed estate write a history of uh, the Normans? You know, he wouldn't know anything about Ireland, but he was howled down, and he's being louder howled down now by the likes of Joel Duffy. Um, but yeah, so what's this? What, 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 how does the estate identify itself, and how does that identification work with the, with the locality? It's, that's how they did it. But it's not a determination. They don't, there's no sheet of paper to say. This was a this was something that um, people who had the they had the intellect, um, they had the time, they had the the will, and they had the pleasure of combining their own personal abilities into into a really interesting. Um, socio-economic development really that benefited everybody you wouldn't know you don't notice the benefit because they weren't they weren't industrialists setting up an industrial factory uh, so you wouldn't you won't you, you don't see a physical um, 
uh, record of, of what they were doing. But I think if you went out into the community here, uh, they, they would tell you about their grandparents, great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents working here, being born here. Uh, you know, wonderful to walk past the lodge, actually gone now in the last 10 years, and the number of people say, oh, yes, I was born there, this was then. So um, that we could have had a different, it had a different kind of history to some of the, well, quite a lot of the big houses so speak, in the country. Absolutely, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and we might come back to some more of those kind of community connections a little bit later on. But one thing I really wanted to ask you about, um, in terms of, uh, you know, you mentioned the kind of the gate, the trees earlier on of, on the estate. Um, uh, can you tell me maybe some more about the physical features of of the estate itself um, and, and things that are on the grounds? Uh, well, yes, um, there was a architectural historian uh, in Dublin called Jeremy Williams. He was big in the George's side and all that sort of thing, but he was an architectural historian, brilliant fellow. He died about three or four years ago. Um, um, he came down here, I, I knew him reasonably well, but he came down here probably 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, he'd been down there before, but about 10 years ago, he was staying the night. And, uh, we were having a conversation and in the morning he got up and we were standing on the steps there at the ranch just looking down across the landscape he said he said the extraordinary thing about this place is uh, it's unchanged nature from the day it was built in other words you've got an integrated house garden and landscape so you've got a, 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 a sort of tri a, a, a shamrock a clover, clover leaf, th three lobes and, and they, they interlap and they integrate and they become the one unit. So this place was never sold, obviously, so there's a continuity. So I know we know the trees. We have, we have an oil painting, a watercolor painting of trees that were planted in 1757 on the birth of John Richards, who was a curate here. So you know those trees. Uh, so these are just trees. If somebody else, if this place is sold, the new people come in, I'll oh, drop those trees, they're causing a shadow and they're going to... So, you know, they're, they're not aware of history. This, this happens time and time again in places, even in, even in, even in town gardens. People, you, you buy a house, but you cut everything first and then you think about replacing it. But all the trees here are planted by somebody. And a large number of them, we know who planted them. And a lot of them are for birthday parties, birthdays or celebrations or something like that. So the trees are there, but they're not just trees. And if you've got a continuity, I mean, we're the eighth generation of grandchildren of the 10th generation. If you've got 10 generation of memory, um, the trees are not just trees there, but the landscape is extraordinary. And uh, it's that, that departure to England in 1798 by John Richards and he going over to England for 20 years and then coming back here, um, he would have seen the, the the estates in England, and he brings that image back here. They were already developing it in a way. So the landscape, the great landscape, um, people that were working in England, Humphrey Repton, Capability Brown, uh, and uh, they did some estates, uh, very few estates over here. They didn't do Monk's Grange, but the principles were known, and the books were read about, and so they followed the principles here. So if you stand on top of the steps there, you can see a Reptonian and a and a Brown a Brownian landscape in front of me still there because we don't fell trees here we keep them there uh, um, uh, and it's the same with the garden the, the garden outline uh, can be seen on that 1757 map but barely but the other the, 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 there's a later survey of about 1820 and you can see the, the outline of the garden in that and it's exactly the same as it is today. So there's this continuity. The house is as it was. There's no big extensions. It hasn't been altered. But you know, a lot of these places had Victorian monstrosities put alongside them. So you have a, a stable house, a stable landscape, a stable garden, and which William said, you know, it's, it's very, very unusual in this country. Now, uh, you know, the place isn't grand enough for OPW people to come along pour money into it and do it all up and that sort of thing but I this is my, my mission at the moment is you better get down here quick because they're, they're, they're about now less than 95 they're losing about 8 
a year of houses that are lived in by the original families. So we're down to about 90 now in Ireland. And they're, they're, it's dropping, and it's going to drop. We're all right, as I said, you're walking across. We have another two generations. Uh, all going, all going well. Uh, uh, but the very nature of this place, uh, I did a talk to the Georgian Society on it, I did a PowerPoint thing in it, uh, on this um, house garden. Um, after Williams said it to me, he said, okay, I better go and research this. So I did myself. Uh, so yeah, it is an interesting aspect of the place that it retains, it, uh, it, it, it's really, it's an 18th century, um, uh, what do you call it, entity, still. Uh, and the trees that have been planted, pro uh, is there uh, uh, prominence of one particular type of tree or is there? No, not necessarily, no. Um, no, not necessarily. The boundary trees, uh, some Scots pine, but there's beech and there's oak. And then uh, in the in the uh, in the mid eighteen hundreds, there was a there was a there was a big um, interest in conifers. So conifers were planted, but not they were always put in as they're decorative. They're decorative. So there's no commercial. Uh, they weren't planted for, for for commerce. Even today, we've about we've two hundred eighty acres here. Eighty acres is in timber, so two hundred acres is in grass. So those timbers are they're decorative trees or the boundary trees or the Victorian double ditches which weren't bulldozed out uh, as you were advised to do by Chagas and Co. Well, it wasn't Chagas, but before that, Agricultural Institute wanted, wanting to improve. You give yourself more land, you go to double ditches. Uh, and in terms of um, upkeep on the estate then as well, are there any kind of maybe local traditions that are still practised in terms of upkeep? Um, or anything like that. Uh, well, I, I, you'd have to say no in a way. I mean, the stonemasons are all gone, so you know the the granite stones here, the the coins, the seals, all that sort of thing. They came from a quarry up in the Corrigan Lane, which is only a mile away from here, and so that that was full of stonemasons there, and they did the stone work for Castle Borough and any any houses that were built, but they've been gone. But they've been gone for probably a hundred years now, uh, but. There was a generation after that quarry uh, of people working on the ha in, here um, uh, on the farm uh, who still had the stone um, carving skills and so could could do repairs. Um, uh, Sonny Murphy, daughter of Lena now, just lives down the road here. Um, she's in her 70s now, but so is Sonny. Is, Sonny is a generation before me. But he was he was a he he could um, he could dress stone. Carpentry wise, they didn't have to because my grandfather was a carpenter, so that work was done. Miley Fenland died in the nineteen sixties. He was a carpenter, could do anything with it. The gardeners all went in the the end of the sixties. There were two permanent gardeners here, and three others who used to come in off the land to keep the whole garden going. They they went. So those those sort of. Yeah, those those skills disappeared. And given that we're in an upland area, is, is there any challenge that that brings? Say, if this house was located somewhere else, um, I know it's kind of a broad question, but um, are there any challenges with living on an estate in an upland area versus an estate elsewhere? Uh, not really. No, I don't think so. No, uh, we're a bit more exposed uh, from an agricultural point of view. Uh, uh, I was always told you can't buy, you can't grow barley up at the, up this altitude. The house is at six hundred feet uh, above sea level, um, so you've got a slight shortening of the seasons, so less ripening time for the grains. You've got the temperature slightly lower, but then we have added rainfall because of the the um, uh, the mountain behind us. We, we have a higher rainfall than most here, uh, so um, no, I don't. I, 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 the place would be wealthier. Um, if it had been what would be called a lowland farm or you know Cast Castle Bora or even Woodbrook down the road here the land is a much better uh, uh, quality of land so it's much more productive so if they were trying to make their money out of agriculture they'd have done better down there than they would up here but there were actually uh, it's a peculiar circumstance but in the the whole of the 1800s there were very few children born here and the families were very small, uh, and uh, uh, so there was no need to be madly productive. Um, 
there was no there was no wealth created then. Uh, it was an utterly different story to the to the big estates in England or uh, here where you had coal mines or you went into an industry and got your wealth and you brought that wealth back into here. This place never had wealth with it. So, or money had it, it never had money with it. Uh, it. It got some money when the estates had to be sold with the, um, um, you know, the 1904. You got capital for the tenancies, uh, but that was generally put into development of the, of the house and development of farms, and so it didn't maintain itself. So, uh, did we benefit from being, oh, it was an adverse up here? It wasn't, no. And in one sense, it's it's a benefit because we're still here. These other places aren't operating, for whatever the reasons. That's a, another study. You know what went on. We've survived, and and the families have all had a good time up here. They're, a lot of the families in the Castle Bores, the Wiltons, they, uh, you know the other places are all burned, or or they've gone derelict, or the sons don't inherit. They have a bad story. The story of this place is good. Um, you mentioned uh, that you obviously have found a, a bounty of archival material or, or items that can be archived. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, have there been any, been any other interesting items found on the estate over the course of its history, be it maybe archaeological kind of material or historic artefacts? Um, not much in artefacts, uh, in, 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 in ha handleable artefacts. Uh, but the fact is that um, the Cistercians operated here. This, uh, the um, uh, Greg Manor was founded uh, in the early 12th century, and the Cistercians were experimental farmers. They were the Chagask of the day, so to speak. Uh, they set up out farms, uh, and uh, uh, as they did in France, where the, where the Cistercians came from. Uh, and the French for an out farm is Grange, Grange, which is also called a granary. But, it, but it's the out farm element. So they established an out farm up here. Now, um, uh, religion ruled life um, very powerfully in, in, the, in the medieval times and earlier. And so there were 200 days of the year when you were, when you were was, there was abstinence from meat. 200 days. So you, had, so you generally found Cistercians and there's strict, stricter monasteries on beside a river where they could have their own fish. Uh, there was also no way of curing meat in those days. You could salt a bit, but they didn't. And they sold their stock uh, in the autumn. They didn't store stock over there because they didn't know anything about silage making, particularly about hay making, they didn't, uh, didn't do that. So you sold your stock and you bought it again. Uh, uh, so you didn't have meat, you have to have fish. So fish was very important. So you come up to a place like this, 600 feet up the mountain, there's no lake or no river, anything like that. Uh, and they obviously decided that they, the quality of land or the, the whatever it was, uh, they were going to be here for a while. So the first thing, if you're going to establish a community uh, anyway, you've got to have water for, for thirst. Uh, the suggestion also had to have water to keep fish in. So first of all, First of all, find a spring that gives a reliable um, and continuous supply of water, uh, just just as aquavita water of life. Then you dig a large pond, uh, sixty feet long, uh, nearly twenty odd feet wide, uh, and it's going to be about six feet deep, and it's on a slope, so it's got to have a big embankment holding the water back. And you build that and you stock it with fish and that's what they did. So that pond is still here today. It's a Cistercian built pond in the 13th century. So it's a physical uh, evidence of the Cistercian occupation here. There are about 40 or 50 of these in, the, in, in Ireland, were built in Ireland. Um, uh, the most famous ones are probably Kilruddery, although the OPW have decided or forgotten or don't want to know the fact that they were Cistercian and said these came from the great garden expansion in the 16th century from France. It, that, in my opinion, is rubbish, but um, uh, there you go. Uh, there are others around the country, and most of them have been filled in, so there's no more There's no more water, but ours is up there, as it was built 800 years ago. It's like an Olympic swimming pool, and it's watertight. The embankment is still there. 
the canal system, the, the spring is still there. It's called Tub, Tub and the Gay of the Well of the Geese. And uh, from where the springs are, it comes down an absolute straight line. It's been, the bottom of the stream has been lined, but not not made, it's not sort of flat flags, but it's had stones there to stop the, stop the stream wearing away and keep it on a straight course. It's in a dead straight line for about 400 yards or meters. Uh, and therefore it's not a wandering stream, it's a constructed one. Uh, and it comes into the pond. So, so the Cistercians have their pond, they have their fish, and they can get on and do whatever they were doing. Um, there's a blank in the, in the history of the place then, really until, uh, until the late, 16th, uh, late 17th century. Uh, but that water source was interesting. Uh, in 1932, the house was still being lit with candles and fires were keeping it warm. Uh, they put a, a dam, uh, they built a smaller pond, just out the back here, 50 yards away from here, which was filled during the day from the water from the Cistercian pond. And then you opened a sluice and it went down to a, to a Pelton wheel generator and they supplied DC electricity to the house from 1932 up to 1955 when the ESP arrived here. So they had 25, 20 years of their own of their own electricity here, thanks to the Cistercians. And I, it's a brilliant story. I've, I've done a little paper on it, on the Cistercians in here. And, and to think that, you know, you're living here courtesy of work that fellas did 800 years ago is just brilliant. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was a lovely story. And so it lit the place here and uh, it was still working. I remember when I was a child coming up here, you you wind a little windy wheel just just outside the door here, and that was in touch with lines physically attached, and it lifted the sluice and started the turbine, and the lights went on. So you you wound this about four o'clock in the evening, the winter when it got dark, and you got about four to five hours of electricity. By about nine o'clock, you could see the light was starting to dim, and you went to bed, and you closed the sluice, filled up again. But what you also did was that when there was plenty of power in the turbine, when you opened the sluice at four o'clock. You could charge accumulators, and every, the households all here ran on accumulators for their radios. So, uh, so there was a, a commercial benefit to it <laughs> from the Cistercians. You got a penny of charge or something for your accumulator. But it's interesting then that the communities uh, were able to upgrade themselves to having electricity through an accumulator for a radio. So you know it wasn't there wasn't enough to run a fridge or the fridges they didn't nobody had fridges in those days they were going to or had electric cookers but you had enough for the radio so uh, yeah that's, inc that's incredible um, yeah we, we might move away uh, a little bit and, and mm -hmm. just um, you know if I was to ask you what does it mean to be now from um, a, a, an upland area what does it mean to you uh, I think it's a great advantage because we're it's a, it, well, not an advantage. It, 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 look, it, it's we're isolated up here. We're along. We're, we've no, we've no. There's no industry up here. There's no main road up here. There's no railway line. There's no airport. You're you're six miles from the nearest airport if it flies overhead, and all you can see the you can see the the contour the contrail, um, and you can hear a slight rum. But that's it. That there's no noise up here. You're pure silence and peace. There's no main road running by us, so we don't have cars running. There's no tourists coming up here. Now, so long as you like that kind of thing, uh, it's you couldn't buy it, and you can just you go quietly about your business here uh, without any interference. Uh, I'd say eighty-five percent of the people in Mon in in County Wexford have never heard of Monks Range. Now, people come up. We have open days now for the last 10 or 15 years because of the archives and all that sort of thing. We have open days and we do courses, lectures and all that sort of thing and gardens open. And they're coming up and they say, how come we've never heard of this place? And I said, well, sure, why? I've never heard of your place. <laughs> and it's kind of, well, we should have heard of it or you should have told it was here because it's almost as if, you know, this sort of place belongs to the public, so to speak. I, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's, it's the same way as... Um, my mother owned the horse Dawn Run. As you might have heard of me, but I know you know racing. So she ran the Cheltenham Gold Cup and the Champion Hurdle. She was the people's horse, you know. 
it was she wasn't my mother's horse it was the people's horse and in some kind of way people come up and say we never knew this place was here and you know this is i think it's a, in, in a, it is it's actually good because they're, they're coming they're discovering their heritage which is a great encouragement for people who aren't aware of what heritage is and it raises the awareness of heritage it's interesting to see it coming out like that uh, what was your question? I no, no, that, you're fine. And um, was, what does it mean? So, how do I live here? Upland, the, well, from the upland areas. I mean, what like what that means to you? Or, and I think, especially given your kind of um, background, that you you weren't um, born in this area. Yeah. But you came to it. Um, yeah, and in you a way, have yeah. a familial connection to it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in that sense, would you consider yourself from the Blackstone Mountains? I do, I do now. Yeah, I'm not. I happen to be born in Dublin. I happen to be brought up more, but no, I, I no, no, no. This is my place, mm. and the community here. But you see, the community community hasn't changed up here. I mean, the number of families here, they're, they're all still here. It's not like a town, and or even you know, there's there's no. Some of them moved out, of course, but but a lot of the families have been here for several hundred years. You know, there are Huguenot families here and that, deacons. Those sort, those sort, those sort of uh, people. Um, it's a very it's a it's a stable part of the world from that point of view. Uh, uh, it was denuded in the thirties, forties, and fifties, but you look at the number of new houses, and now you look at the people, the the, the children are building a house on their land, and uh, we got people actually wanting to live here and are living here, uh, and so. There's, there's a look. I'm 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 not a professional in it, but there's there's a every every community has its strength, but the, this has a strong community strength to it, and I feel part of that, uh, and and I, I I hope everybody else sees it as that we're all part of part of an upland community that's isolated. We're minding our own business. We've got a fantastic hurling team from Rathnera. Uh, their county championships year after year, their club championships year. We've had great hurlers from here. We've all, we've got all that sort of stuff that you won't really. I know you, you do have that sort of sense, even in suburbs, in suburbs, in suburbs, in towns, and that sort of things. So, so we're as rich as they are, and I would think we're actually richer because uh, uh, we can still walk down, drive down the road, and you would stop the car and wind the window down. You talk to them. Uh, so that kind of community engagement is interesting. It's old fashioned, it's quaint, but it can still be done, you know. And we all know who lives in what house where. So well, you mightn't in your own suburb you know everybody in your own street, and would you talk to everybody in the street? I'm not saying everyone talks to everybody here. There's an occasional row, but. <laughs> and, and so there's all that familiarity that exists, um, and storied families that have lived here for you know, a long, long time. Um, has anything changed notably in your time living here? Well, physically or agriculturally, there are changes. Um, uh, I think it's more open. I mean, my, my grandparents my grandparents weren't drinkers, so they wouldn't have gone to the pub. My uncle John, who was a, he became vice president of the IFA, the NFA, and then the IFA. He was big in that, um, and he did a lot of work in Dublin. Went three days a week to Dublin and worked, worked, worked for the NFA up there. There was a thing called the, the, the they, they had a bar of their own, a, a club. He was a very convivial man, and. Um, and then when he went away to meetings, various around the country, always ended up in the pub. But he always said he would never go to the pubs in Rathnure or Canaan because he felt it would make the other people uncomfortable that he was coming down from the big house to go to the pub, which, should, which, which was their place. Uh, that was odd because he was a very convivial man and when he was, when he was working in the NFA, he was meeting people at every level of society anyway. Uh, so he was well used to it. But it was a... It's a peculiar thing to have to, say, to to be saying, but he did it out of respect that he didn't want to upset that. Now that that's gone because we go down and we fall off the bar stool and records and fall off the bar stool in quadrants. <laughs> so that's changed. Uh, that's a healthy change. Um, yeah, it's funny one to note, but <laughs> uh, agriculturally, yes, changed a little bit. Um, and then the. Um, 
Well, the interest in the place from outside the community uh, is a notable change, and that's largely promoted by the archive, really, uh, um, and our engagement with the with the conference papers and that sort of thing, and the people who come to study whatever's going on. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned just to pick up on that. Um, you mentioned earlier on about tourism in the area. Um, how would you how would you view the current state of tourist traffic to Rathmuir or to Caman oh, well or even to the Blackstairs and more broadly? It just doesn't happen. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, I don't do it anymore. But my son Ben runs in the mountain, uh, and uh, um, so to so the son-in-law, and he'd say, "Look, you go up there. You might find four or five other hill runners on a really good day." Uh, most days there'll be nobody else up there so there's nobody up there there's, there's this magnificent area up there of of wonderful wilderness and uh, so the athletes aren't really up there the cyclists aren't around here because there's nowhere for refreshment or rest for them the, you know the pubs are closed the shops are barely open in the little villages restricted times uh, you can't even go to Kiltili up here which is a sort of probably the liveliest of the villages, but there's no coffee shop up there, nothing. So you go from Bunclody, over, over that side, all the way down to Ballywillian, uh, and and almost to New Ross, before you can get a cup of tea or coffee. So why would a tourist come up here and go for a 30 mile walk, if you can't get a cup of tea or coffee when you get down? Uh, it's not signposted as a, a tourist area, there are no trails to find. Um, which is grand from our point of view because we have it for ourselves. Um, there's no tourism to here, no. So you, if you arrive in Rosslare, you drive, you get in the car and you drive for an hour and a half and you get to Tipperary and you might stay there or you drive for four hours and get into Kerry and get on with your holiday. And you drive right past uh, this extraordinary circle around Blackstairs Mountain you know, from the Barrow River and all the mountain area here, then down this side, and you can have the Slaney or the Bora, and uh, the, the, the history that surround here, um, all, all um, uh, uh, unaware. You mentioned um, trails in the mountain, mm. um, and you mentioned that, and you mentioned you, you've been up, you, you used to do it, mm. um, and maybe you don't do it anymore. Give me an idea of what, what you would see along that trail. Well, the problem is you're going to see um, once once it's promoted and the and the uh, the um, infrastructure is put in to support tourism, I, uh, you'll have a flood of tourism. But even before that, like if we were to say take it in its natural state, what what are the kind of plants that we're seeing along that way? What are the the kind of views? What what's oh no, well, it's outstanding. I mean, if you you walk the ridge from Bally William to Montclody, you up the White Mountain then down and up Blackstairs and down and up Mount Leinster and down I mean I don't know how many counties you can see from Mount Leinster you know, they'll tell you it's 10 or 15 or 5 or whatever <laughs> I have never counted them but you'll see to the horizon and beyond as I said and the same from here you look down to the Salties and the Hook and everything it's, it's an astonishing sight up there and there's nobody up there you've got you've got it up there on your own and you know where, where do you buy that sort of wilderness I don't think you can do it in, in the Swiss Alps anymore they're crammed with people viewing coming to look at the, the flowers and the pastures and then they go skiing in the winter here and there's nobody up there nobody in these places so if you like peace and quiet and you like rambling you know that's that's where you should be occasional cyclists come by and they well two two people arrived up here actually but again it was about 10 or 15 years ago and we said how did you know this place is here and they said well we come from holland and we do a lot of cycling in holland and in holland they gave us um, cycling maps um, of trails and this the the, the boundary the the the, um, the road around you know from Bally William Bon Clody in the south and then around the no northern side of it is on this map here so they'd got a map from a cycling club in Holland with this um, one day cycle around it uh, and I thought yeah, that was really astonishing because <laughs> Port Folger don't have it and wouldn't have it, but they, but they were the one thing they were saying. He said we can't stay anywhere here and we can't get a cup of tea. Where can we get something to eat? And you can't. Yeah. So so, if I was to ask you then, what role do you think maybe communities and, and businesses could play 
to improve tourist traffic and footfall to the area? Oh, look, I think there's unlimited opportunity. Um, well, you don't want unlimited opportunity, do you? Because you know, you, you've got to be careful what you're doing with a, with a precious wilderness area. Uh, if you if you suddenly have ten thousand people walking across, it's not a wilderness area anymore. So it's hard to hard to you've got to work on the balance side. But you can you can control if you wanted to control that you can control it by having the limited resources. But there has to be there has to be a hotel somewhere, or 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 uh, or what they're talking about in Canaan about putting up a hostel. Uh, you know, even for ten eight or ten people. Uh, who could have a shower and then you know get a get a sandwich in the in the place? There have to be eating places, and and why wouldn't there be? I mean, Bunclody does have a couple of tea rooms, I think, but that's only for the local people. It's not part of the the built into the tourism uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, and there are hotel opportunities, and out of all that, there's employment. There's also there's untold development that you could do down here, but but from my point of view, I mean, I'd always I'd always be careful of. You know, you, you don't destroy the golden egg, you know, which is the wilderness. But we need, we we need we need the, we need the we need an economy. Uh, in in any community needs an economy. I mean, all the, all the new houses that are being built here, they're they're prob they're being funded by somebody who's working in town. Or somebody with an off farm income. Uh, the, 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 there's no local industry here, and I wouldn't. We don't want local industry. Um, you know, uh, uh, smoke and steam and that sort of stuff. No, that type of industry. But but um, certainly you can have. Why can't you have? You know, the sort of things the tourists like buying, um, uh, or whatever else interests them. I mean, there should be should be top class restaurants here with all the good food that we grow here. Look look at uh, look at West Cork. You know, absolutely crammed with good food, local food. Off the uh, five acres, or you're milking five goats. There's none of that up here. There's the, the farmers' market in Enniscorthy. It's all bought-in stuff. Nothing comes from a farm in Wexford in there. Talk, talk to me a little bit more about food from this area. About food? Yeah, from this area. Um, well, it's produced and sold into commercials. So the dairy farmers are producing milk and selling it, uh, but it's gone. Uh, it's the same with the cattle; they're gone. So they're they're not making local food here. Uh, there's, there's, uh, I, I, well, we do honey here. Um, there's been, there's been, there's been beekeeping here since 1900 continuously. There are a few other people doing beekeeping and selling the honey locally, but it's not a big thing, and there aren't enough people wanting to buy the honey. Really. So, uh, so that's that, that's 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 a small little. Uh, uh, we're too high up to be part of the soft fruit industry, which is huge. Because we're, we're just at that altitude, you lose a couple of temperature, bit of temperature. But I said it to Edward jokingly, that's the grandson. I said you should start planting a few vines in the inside wall garden here, and give it twenty years, and you're going to have two or three degrees of temperature added here, and you'll have a vineyard. <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm serious. It's a sort of sort of thing. It's a it's a mad thought, but you wouldn't miss an acre here, planted in vines, just to see what the hell would happen. Uh, but look you can't you can go into the butchers and you can go into Stafford's in Enniscorthy right enough and you can buy meat from their herd so they have their own little farms down the road here and the beach cuts so that's local meat from their herd from a local herd but after that local produce it's not being produced and it's not being marketed as such and it's not easy to buy I mean, it's such a different situation than in England where every farm would have a stall at the entrance gate there with stuff laid out on it. So there's, there's none of that in this area at all. Whether there's an opportunity or for it or not, I don't know, because it, the upland thing comes in again. And, and uh, you know, can you, are you going to be able to produce enough strawberries to compete with the lads down in the, in the slightly warmer area? I, you know, that's, a, that's another, another issue. Sure. Um, so again, just go back to tourism for a second. If you could pick one site in the Black Stairs region that you would suggest and recommend to a tourist party, what would that be and why? Um, I'm going to look, it depends if you're walking, driving, cycling or what. Uh, uh, look, I think the, ma the major asset is the, is the, the range of hills uh, from you know, Valley Wilder to Bonte Um There are easy walks, uh, 
there are arduous walks there's nothing steep there are no cliffs but it's a it's a tough one to go up to the top of black stairs and down again and then back up again so that's okay lots of people like you know challenges like that but for uh, you know if you've got a car you can you can drive up to the ridge and you can go for a walk for a quarter of a mile and see 10 counties um, it's that that's the biggest one um, his, history wise and as for a historical place uh, there's nowhere there's nowhere that I mean nothing nothing important happened here at Monk's Grange where everyone say well you must go to Monk's Grange because uh, um, you know so, so you know, somebody signed the Declaration of Independence there <laughs> it's, there's nothing like that uh, you can tell a story about John Kelly, but look, the John Kelly's all over the place, and the poor fellow then, I mean, he died in New Ross, and, that's, and then he's hanged around and quartered in Wexford. So John Kelly's history is really belongs to New Ross and Wexford rather than where he's actually from. Um, so that requires an interpretive centre, and interpretive centres are generally failures. <laughs> so they interpret uh, well enough for the exact period that they're built in, but five years later they're stale and outdated, and there's a reinterpretation. So I, I, if, I'm quite sure that something will come of your study uh, that you're part of. I just hope it's not... Uh, I hope it's not brought forth you're driven and that it's driven by people like you have have a wider insight. That That's my hope for what that, your project, the project that's going on is. Uh, and I think that it would be very important. And as I said... Is there no point in in in, in destroying uh, the budgie that's in the cage and won't sing anymore because there are too many people there? But a difficult balance. I mean, people might like to live here and they need to live here, and you need an economy here. It's it, it, it's a touchy one, but uh, you know, you go down to Cork and Kerry, and where there's developed tourism, highly developed tourism, the people who are living there now are probably used to it all, and they understand that's what you. Uh, how you make a living whereas up here we wouldn't understand that's how you make a living yet because you've got to learn it that uh, uh, mm. and if you were to oh, let's just say hypothetically if you were to open Monk's Grange to the public yeah what is the feature that you would be most proud to showcase um, well I think I would show this integrated state of house, garden, and landscape, uh, uh, and ask people to understand that integration and what it means as uh, as something scarce and rare. Uh, and then there's, there's there are hundreds of things you can hang off that. I mean, the garden has a has a significant hi history. Um, uh, there are significant, there's a, there's a sort of, there's a connection not with the actual people, but with the design concepts of Gertrude Jekyll and Edwin Lutyens, who were a famous pair of garden designers in England. Lutyens was a famous architect in Edwardian times in England. Uh, uh, that's unexplored here. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, I'm winning the battle to get people to come down and have a look and that, that sort of thing. There are numerous things like that. It's a Cistercian pond. You could spend, two hours there, talking to people telling people about it and you'd almost you would have to and I wouldn't mind it uh, yeah. well uh, yeah, I don't want to see it myself but the next generation might have to for instance so you do a sort of thing like um, like the um, what's it called the, down at Ferry Carrick the um, Heritage Park so you've got to put up a, a hut or something the sort of thing that the surgeon would have been living in and then you can talk to people about that and then I could do it I could do a day's tour here now I could I could feel do a six hour tour for people now off the top of my head walking around and they wouldn't hear me I wouldn't repeat a word in six hours it would be a long walk around but I could do it so there are there are hundreds of aspects to this place that are interesting and to say which is the most interesting that, that that's that's a difficult one and I'd, I'd only throw in the great big lump of the the garden, the house, and the and they all make make something unique. I wouldn't say it's unique, but it's rare. Um, and then you can then you talk talk about each individual lobe. Uh, 
and you talk about the enterprises you know, the, the history was all here is documented we don't have to make up stories so um I mean, it's a heritage center. Uh, but we can't have people crawling over it. That's the thing. I mean, what does this mean? You, people say, can I look at the archive room? I say, you open up the door and this is what they see. Well, it doesn't mean anything. You know, you're looking at filing cabinets and gray boxes. Uh, so you can't really pull those out every day and lay them out and show 100 people out there. I mean, this, we limit we limit eight people at a time in the room here. And, and they're... they're, they're bona fide groups with this particular interest so uh, but you could you can talk outside in the front there of the heritage of the house and the history of the house over 250 years and how it developed and what the influences are and this sort of thing and you can do the same in the garden and you can do the same out in the physical features of the of, of, of out here we have an osiery for instance so willows where you grow willows for basket making everybody had to have baskets you couldn't go to petters in those days and buy a plastic bag you had to bring a wicker basket with you uh, so everybody had, had uh, needed wicker. So you you plant willows. So we've got the osiery there. Uh, it's it's about two acres, three acres of willows. The, the willows are largely gone, but it's still called the osiery, and you can see why it's there. Um, there was um, uh, they grew flax here, so for for cloth cloth making, everybody did because you know you couldn't go in and into the shop. Uh, you couldn't take the car into the shop. There's no car to get you into the shop, and the shop probably isn't there either. So you make your own. So, you know, the physical features are all there to explain what an osiery is and there for the baskets. And then here's the flax making place. You've got the pond, you've got, you've got the fields themselves and the names of the fields and what, you can talk about the names of the fields. What does that reflect about what the architecture is? So you can go on and on about this place. Well, if I was to ask you what your favorite feature of Monk's Grange is. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> uh, I don't, it's a silly answer, but it's it's mere existence and it's survival. Yeah. yeah, its survival is extraordinary, and what it survived with, in other words, the supporting information here. Uh, that's, that, that's richer. This is the largest archive in private hands in Ireland. I mean, that's a big statement. It's not me that makes it. It's Terry Dooley and, and Sean Duffy and those sort of people. This is a massive, massive archive, uh, and and it's 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 yeah, talk. <laughs> so, if we were to just reflect on a, on a few things, um, if I was to say to you, what's the best thing about living, either here or in the broader kind of community? What's the best thing about living in, in this upland area? Well, I like the peace and the quiet. Uh, I like the you're you're in the middle of nature. Yeah, there's nothing to trouble your existence here. Um, there's no noise from the neighbours. There's um, there's no noise of town. There's uh, it's just pure. You're 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 with your own. You're with yourself. Now you need to be comfortable with that. Uh, but we have visitors who come here and they stay the night and they you know they wake up in the middle of the night and they can't hear anything. And you, they come down in the morning, you have a good sleep. Jeez, it's very quiet here, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, lots of people live in these uh, in the area here and in, in the same sort of, sort of place. They don't have as expansive of here. I mean, the other thing about, you get up in the morning here and you can do what you want. You can come here and you can do paperwork. You can go up to the yard and you can do agricultural work. You can go down to the wood and you can listen to the wood pigeons or the woodpecker. You can go out get a tractor and you can top the grass on it. So you have thousands of things to do. The choices of how you spend your time and how you're going to spend your day or your week or your month or your year, which are limited to you in towns really and in smaller houses. So it's a very special place to be in. And it's a, you know, talk about the bed you're born in. I mean, I, we do, I pull the curtains in the morning, you look out and you say, Jesus, that's it. Is it something else to have been, to have the, to have to be, to be given the privilege, whatever you call it, I don't particularly like that word, but, you know, to, to be living here just as a matter of birth when you could be in a slag heap in, in Bombay or something, you know? I mean, it's, geez, it's, it's, it's quite something. Uh, and what challenges do you think um, that this area or indeed a space like this might face in the kind of short to long term future? 
um, well, it's it's survival in its long term future depends on its economic circumstances. So uh, you've got to have the you've, you've got to have the um, you've got to have the people who are prepared to work it and to work the work whatever the opportunities are, and they'll change over time. If you don't have the people, then the place uh, decays away and gets sold and becomes a, a golf course or whatever. Uh, uh, or new people come in, the super wealthies, who are happy to own it, but they don't really care, it's just another place to go and stay. And it's theirs. But they don't have to be conscious of its heritage or anything. They're just super wealthies, have a different outlook on things. As far as I'm concerned, and it's not healthy, uh, but that's that's a threat to a place like this. So it's, 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 the threat is that you uh, you get a generation who, who has no interest. Uh, but it's two generations for me, and I'll be long dead, and I can't spend my life worrying about it. And I won't spend my I don't spend my life worrying about it. I was anxious about it, but I'm no longer anxious anymore because I know the panel can go on. He's 15 or 20 years doing. Ed was showing interest, that's fine by me, so I can die. And we've done our bit. Um, we've, I mean, that's a whole other story. We've, we've, we've done all sorts of renovations on the place here, done the garden, it was, you know, all, all these, we've, we've done a lot here. And we were lucky, we were interested and we got, we were interested in heritage and history and all that sort of thing. So. That that helped us go. There's the, not so much of that now. They're busy. They're busy. Everybody's busier, this generation than we were in ours. So their focus, our focus, was in the the, the care and maintenance of the place uh, and the upgrading of it. Their focus is on the business uh, end of it and getting the money in to survive here and to do work. I'm not saying that they don't do any work, but it wasn't a, wasn't the focus it was with us. Um, it's like a business. This is just like a like a business, a, a family business. I mean, how many generations of family business last? It it lasts as long as we're still making money, and there are people interested in keeping the business going. Uh, but that and it's more. But it's more than that. There's a there's a responsibility, uh, which I don't really like talking about. But it is. I mean, if you if you if you're privileged enough, if you're given the gift, you mean given the gift of living in a place like this. You owe somebody something, and you owe your community, or you owe, you owe the country. You owe something, and I don't mean that in a mealy mouth way, but you do. So there you are obliged to look after the thing. So it's not that we don't take holidays, but I mean, if you spend money rewiring a place like this or replumbing, whatever you do, do that's it's not equity you take away with you when you sell the place at the end. Your equity, your money's gone, but that's part of what you do if you live in a place like this. And I, I, I don't like talking about this whole subject because it sounds like mealy mouth and that kind of thing. And I, but it's it's a serious it's a serious consideration, uh, and it's a responsibility in a way. You you a responsibility to the ancestors, they they bust their guts to keep the planks going. And so why should you just come along and have a party for thirty years? Uh, uh, so you have that. We all say here, look, you don't actually own this place. It's it's a relay race. You're carrying the baton. And uh, there's a certain responsibility about carrying the baton and passing the baton on and that sort of thing. But it's not overbearing. Um, uh, we're lucky uh, it, it's, it's happened here all, all the time, but it, it's kind of, it kind of, um, it colours the way you, you, you live your life in a place like this. Absolutely. Um, and, and what about, again, just broader challenges to maybe Calan or um, Rathnur um, in the short and long term? future so, uh, 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 broader challenges just you know moving forward like what what kind of issues might might crop up or do you like given the current state of of these, these well i would like to see that i would like that i would like to see the two uh, uh, villages as vibrant villages um uh, because uh, well it's a waste of a, it's a waste of it's a waste of history it's a waste of assets uh, the standing buildings there it's a waste of location it's a waste of opportunity to benefit community um, uh, look you go you go go over to Boris you know and see what they've done now I hate hanging baskets uh, that's English I don't want to turn Rathnir and Killan into Little England uh, and, and that's why I don't like this tidy towns competition because it's it means turning a place into Little England 
Now Boris is Boris is good, but it's it hasn't got it right either. Rosie loves it. My wife loves it. She said oh, Boris is wonderful. Kilan can do that, and Rathnir can do that, but do it carefully and and get the get the shops in, get interesting shops in that people are wanting to go to. You don't have to do Kildare Village or something like that, but there must be something. And it's not my role to think of it. I'm not on any of the committees. I've enough to do here without thinking of that. But there, there's ample opportunity for what's going on. And I take my hat off to the lads who bought Rackets Pub, and I've got the vision to see that they can, they can. It's the start of a revival of a hub, um, but you need the, you need the other community things that people need whatever they are and whatever and Rathnir could do it too and uh, uh, just as just as and you have a vibrant place that people are going to want to come to have a restaurant have a Michelin restaurant here if you can get somebody to come up and do it because the people will come to it the chipper in 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 Kilan, they could come from 20 miles away to go to Sonny's chipper there you, you wouldn't believe the number of chips and sausages sold out of there on a Friday and Saturday night they're teeming in it so these people why would they not like to have a steak instead of a fish and a sausage? They would like to have a steak, but you can't have it here. So we could have restaurants here. So that means you can have small little fellows growing beds of asparagus to feed into the, you know, all that, all that sort of thing. I would hope that they would have that. But I would also hope, dearly hope, that you don't overcook the pudding and therefore spoil the whole place. Sure. Um, so just, just in closing then, um, what does it mean to you to be from this area and you said you do feel that you have that affinity even though you weren't born here but you feel you have that affinity so what does it mean um, to you to be from this from from this area well the mountain is the earth mother they're very fundamental feelings um, without a doubt an earth mother and my mother felt that as well I mean, she she grew up here and then lived in Waterford and she used to come you know, you'd be driving up here in the car and she'd say, oh, there's Blackstairs. And, you know, now I know what she meant about it. That's, a, that's, a, you know, it's a very basic um, construct of what home is. And so you've got the, you've got the, you've got the mountain as your earth mother. That's a big thing. Um, oh, look, the other thing is, what am I, more, uh, uh, I'm, I'm nearly 80 years coming here, so I'm 80, 80 yesterday. So I'm a long time coming here. It's very familiar to me. It's right. It's in my. It's in the. It's in my core. So whatever that means. Um, yeah, but this is this is more than home. This is where you live and where you die, uh, and uh, just where you belong. Uh, the Aboriginals will talk about it. This is you know they talk about uh, the concept of what they call country. So it's a, it's a wide area, you know, it, it can be a couple of thousand acres and that's country. And that's where once they get into country, just everything falls away. And this is where you live, die, where your ancestors were from and they're going to be from. Uh, uh, and th this is the, 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 the core of your, the core of your very self. And it's very strongly developed in, in, in Aboriginal society. Uh, we uh, we have it here, but I think people don't they don't express it in the same sort of way. You know, if somebody gets killed in in a, in a road accident, and the priest is on. He said, "Well, this is a very tight knit community." Well, look at if every every community was so tight knit, you wouldn't talk to anyone outside it. I think it's a horrible term, <laughs> a tight knit community. You need a loosely knit community that's bound, but uh, but in contact with everyone else. And I like the sense of contact. I like the can the sense. I like the sense of contact with everybody around here whatever wherever they are from whatever religion they are whatever politics they are we all know what the difference of politics are that's what you do in a community you know and, and we all tolerate which uh, one another and we get on uh, and i like that uh, so it's a there's a bounded sense of living here um but there's also the fact that you yeah you can there's outreach as well and uh, we come from, we're from Wexford, yeah, and we're from Leinster, and then we're from Ireland, and then you're from Europe, uh, and so on. But, um, yeah, home is home for everybody. But I think nature actually gets into your core as well, so that the sense of earth mother of the mountain. And then, yeah, like I said, the trees are representative of 
eight generations before me and you know that so you've got a very close association it's a sort of spiritual feeling um, and I'm, I'm not religious and I don't do that sort of spiritual stuff but that's what it is it's a spiritual sense of the place and you belong to it and uh, uh, they value that and is there anything else that you'd like to add to the record that we haven't previously discussed before we finish well have you got a year <laughs> I wish <laughs> Uh, I know. I know. Look, I just. I, I. think it's terrific. I think the whole concept is is, is great. Uh, just don't cook. Don't overcook the pudding. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. That was really, really fascinating. Well, and very enjoyable. So I will stop the recording now. Yeah.